Faculty of Science, Prince of Songkhla University, Hatjai Campus. It is really a pleasure to be here as a moderator because I'm sure that we all will get precious time, fully equipped with a number of creative ideas, just like every time we have done so far. Welcome everyone to Dr. Tanat Korman's speech, which is a part of the seventh ASEAN Week organized by Dr. Tanat Korman ASEAN Studies Center, Prince of Songkhla University, right here at Room 210, President Office Building, via Zoom and PSU Connect. Our honored speaker this year is His Excellency Dr. Surya Jindawong, Ambassador Designate of the Kingdom of Thailand to the Republic of Singapore, on the topic Medical and Public Health Collaboration in the ASEAN Community. May I take this opportunity to provide brief information about the speaker? Dr. Surya Jindawong got PhD degree from Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, Tufts University, Massachusetts, the USA. He was an assistant manager of Global Finance Asia Division, Citibank Bangkok, before working in Ministry of Foreign Affairs with incredible promotion up to Director General of the Department of ASEAN Affairs. And starting from the 18th of January this year, he is an ambassador designate of the Kingdom of Thailand to the Republic of Singapore. May I call upon the Assistant Professor Dr. Niwat Kavada, PhD President, for a welcome speech and introducing the speaker. Thank you. Your Excellency, Ambassador Dr. Surya Jindawong, Prince of Songkhla University Administrators and Colleagues, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great honor for Prince of Songkhla University to welcome. Your Excellency Ambassador Dr. Surya Jindawong as a guest speaker of the seventh Dr. Tanat Korman speech with a talk entitled Medical and Public Health Collaboration in the ASEAN Community. This event is organized to honor Dr. Tanat Korman, the founder of ASEAN and Prince of Songkhla University. A talk is delivered each year during ASEAN week, approximately during uh, August or uh, September or October, depending on the availability of the speaker. With the topic and speaker proposed by the ASEAN Week Committee of Prince of Songkhla University. During Thailand's Chairmanship of ASEAN in 2019, Your Excellency Ambassador Dr. Surya Jindawong was the Director General of the ASEAN Affairs Department of Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Thailand. He was one of the key officers responsible for Thailand's success at the chair, which included the launching of seven ASEAN centers in Thailand. These achievements highlight ASEAN's vision to build a stronger, more caring and sharing community for future generations. This year, the COVID-19 pandemic has been a great challenge for ASEAN collaboration on medical and health issues. Although our region has not been affected as severely as Europe and America, we must still work together to battle the outbreak and keep everyone safe. And the current ambassador to Singapore, Your Excellency, had has to deal directly with issues related to the welfare and repatriation of Thai citizens. I am sure that his views definitely will benefit and enhance ASEAN's collaboration on medical and public health. 
please welcome our guest speaker, Your Excellency, Ambassador Dr. Surya Jindabu. Center for graciously extending an invitation for me to speak. The, uh, seventh, this is the seventh uh, lecture or speech of the uh, Dr. Tanat Koman uh, series, and therefore um, to, to talk about to talk about an issue which is very close to my heart, professionally and personally, as well as to uh, more than 650 million. Uh, people here in Southeast Asia. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Niwat Gyalbrada, the president of the Prince of Songkla University, um, as well as, of course, Dr. Pipachuto, the moderator, for the kind words of introduction. I have about 30 minutes. Uh, I'd like to engage in what I'd like to call a conversation uh, with dear friends about uh, what is happening within ASEAN and especially at this extraordinary times of the COVID-19 challenge. Uh, and therefore the topic uh, as suggested by the, uh, the university is, is very relevant, uh, which is the, the medical and public health cooperation in the ASEAN community, all right? And we are after all a community now, all right, since uh, 2015. So this is the journey I'd like to walk with you for the next 30 minutes. And of course, I'll be happy to take uh, questions and even, and of course, comments from, from, from friends uh, who are gathered uh, in this network of the Prince of Songha University. Okay, let me, let me start. Since the lecture series is uh, referring, is the Dr. Tanai Koman uh, lecture series, I, it is only appropriate that I begin by recalling the last conversation I had with Dr. Thanat Kauman, the um, former foreign minister of the Kingdom of Thailand and one of the five founding fathers of ASEAN, and indeed was the one who initiated, thought of the ASEAN idea. I last talked to him uh, face to face in around 1991, that's almost uh, 30 years ago. I was uh, finishing my dissertation and I wanted to, to interview and ask questions about ASEAN, and of course, who better to ask than Dr. Tanak Koman, one of the founding fathers of ASEAN. So I remember um, in his uh, nice house, um, a very serene setting um, in, in uh, Pepperi Road, and I had about 10 questions that I wanted to ask him. Uh, I started with the first question. Uh, why did you create ASEAN? And he took one hour to explain. And so therefore, I only had to ask that one question. But when you look at it, I think his answer, in my view, basically answered all the other questions. Because in answering why ASEAN was created, I think Dr. Tanakoman helped answer all the other questions that people may have had about the future of Southeast Asia. Now, remember, the, the interview I had with him was in 1991, and he was recalling what was happening in 1967, you know, over 50 years ago. But many things that he said are still relevant today. And let me just uh, recall a little bit of what he said. I asked, uh, well, you know, why did we have to create this regional organization? After all, we had, you know, very close ties with uh, many uh, Western countries at that time, and, and still do. We were in the midst of the Cold War. Why was it necessary to create something regionally? And, and to summarize, his answer was that, I think it is appropriate that the region find its regional voice. We have to start looking 
to ourselves and our neighbors within the region and find a way to create a common future together. And if I just may take a little quote from the Bangkok Declaration, or what is called the ASEAN Declaration that established ASEAN in 1967, you can see that it talks very much about a regional identity, about coming together. And essentially, it, the quote says that we are to secure for the region, is to, I quote, secure for their peoples. I, 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 let me underline, peoples. Let me say again, secure for their peoples and for posterity. That means for future generations. Secure for their peoples and for posterity the blessings of peace, freedom, and prosperity. What you already see there since 1967 was not only a sense that of the urgency of having greater regionalism as an option, as the only way out to this competition amongst major powers that was a time called the Cold War. But it was also a reflection of the need to focus on people, people security, human security, and to come to the top today, today, what is it that's most important for human security? One of the most important factors, which is, and that is health security, public health, the well-being, medically, socially, of the ordinary people of Southeast Asia. So there you have it, dear friends. In 1967, you had, if you want to use the analogy, the kernel or the seed being planted to a sense of need for regional cooperation to advance human security, to create a people-centered region. And one of the most important factors is, of course, the life, well-being of the people of Southeast Asia. So this is um, what I want to, 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 to get from, out from the very beginning, that the vision and thinking of Dr. Thanat Khom uh, even in 1967, more than 50 years ago, was looking really forward to today and to the future. What can we do to ensure better livelihoods and better security? And I'm not talking about just defense and all that, that is important, but really about the human security, the medical well-being, the medical condition, and the public health of the peoples of our region. That is why I use this uh, introduction to bring us to the present day. Now, we all know what ASEAN is about. It started with an organization of five, an association of five. We are now a community of 10 countries. We have uh, develop a closer community bond in the various pillars of ASEAN cooperation. And there are uh, for becoming a more people-centered community with a strong emphasis on advancing the uh, people's interests and welfare. The people-centered ASEAN community is very much part of the policy of ASEAN. It has been for quite some time since uh, the ASEAN Charter uh, was, was adopted around, I believe, 2008, 2009. And it has become a central theme of the ASEAN community. The strategic directions as we seek to overcome the pandemic challenge that we are facing right now, the COVID-19 challenge, and looking forward to the post-COVID era. How can ASEAN collaboration in the medical area, in the public health area, be further advanced? And how is it an important part of the ASEAN community? All right. So that is that is the 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 with that introduction, I'm gonna go I'll go more into detail as to what we can expect and what we hope ASEAN would do in the months and years ahead with regard to the medical and public health issue. Um, let me say from the very beginning, I will divide my discussion or my conversation. I'll well, start, start first, of course, with the COVID-19 situation because this is an the issue that is on everyone's minds right now. Uh, but let me just uh, say that um, public health 
and medical cooperation with ASEAN is not just limited to COVID-19, you know, facing the COVID-19 challenge or the pandemic. There are other pandemics and there are many other medical and public health issues, which is uh, very important for ASEAN and the region in the short and long run. So uh, I will have, uh, I will start with the COVID-19 then, and then branch out to the, the other issues. Uh, looking, looking at COVID-19, it is a pandemic. And what is the picture that we see right now? And then I will look at it from an ASEAN perspective here in Southeast Asia. I will not talk much about the COVID-19 because we've been following it very closely, each of you in the various different fields, but it is, in the words of many leaders and policymakers, it has almost uh, been categorized almost all the time as a once in a generation crisis. Now that says a lot, once in a generation crisis, a challenge of such a big scale that perhaps comes once in a generation and has to be overcome. But why is it once in a generation? What makes it different from other pandemics and indeed from other challenges that the region and the world faces? First of all, there's a lot of unknowns. We all know this. It is a new virus. It is a new pandemic. There's still questions as to uh, what uh, its characteristics, what will be its trends, all right? Um, and uh, scientists and doctors are working around the clock around the world to resolve these issues, but we really don't know all the facts yet about this virus. And that, that compared to the other pandemics that ASIN has faced and the world has faced in the past, whether it's SARS, um, you know, Ebola, Zika, avian flu, and others, we are living in a much more connected world. There's a great degree of connectivity within Southeast Asia, within ASEAN. After all, we are an adult community. And with the rest of the world, the global travel, not only physically, but in terms of the information flow, is much more intense. And with it, the greater risk and the greater speed, speed in which pandemics can you know, uh, be disseminated. The pandemic, the virus, is what we call in uh, ASEAN language or in, in, in the UN language sometimes. It's, a, it's been quoted several times. It's a problem. It's a global problem without a passport. That is, it doesn't recognize any boundaries and can spread quite easily. We all know that. The third key factor is the comprehensiveness of this pandemic. It affects, obviously, the medical uh, perspective, the medical pillar affects human lives. The medical challenges are great. The public health challenges are great. And it also has, because of its um, uh, impact on connectivity, it has a great um, uh, impact also on economic consequences, social consequences. And so the, the, if, you make, if you look at the, the virus, as the epicenter, the effects are global and affects basically all aspects of people's lives. And that what makes it, that's what, what makes it uh, a little bit uh, more of a challenge compared to other pandemics in the past. The picture, I just read the, um, it was, uh, I think in the, uh, the um, uh, World Health Organization uh, in various me news media came out, I think yesterday. Already estimates are, are coming out the, uh, some of the estimates that it is possible that the virus has now affected one out of every 10 people on this planet. One out of every 10, all right? So that is much more than the about 33 million cases of infections that we have globally right now. One out of every 10, that's, uh, well, the estimates come out to say about 800 million. Uh, we'll have to check uh, what the latest projections are on this, but this is some of the estimates of the hidden uh, the hidden um, uh, infections. Uh, but the reported infections is about, um, worldwide is about 33 million. And these, what I just referred to are some of the estimates that come out from, came out from the WHO as to possibly unreported cases. Uh, the, the headline that came out is about one out of every 10 person is affected globally. Deaths, um, we have um, close to a million right, statistics as of 28th of September. Oh, how's it in Southeast Asia? In Southeast Asia, in, in ASEAN, the 10 ASEAN countries, 
uh, 700, over 700,000 infections at last count. These are the reported infections. Now, we don't know about the unreported infections. And uh, over 17,000 deaths, accumulative, all right, uh, since the uh, pandemic started uh, as of around a couple of days ago. So it is, it is a, um, it is a uh, challenging picture that we're facing. And it is something that ASEAN as a regional organization and as a community cannot simply just not do anything. And to its credit, I would have to say that ASEAN has done quite a bit. And I'm going to discuss what are some of the parameters of such cooperation and what are some of the limitations and challenges that are being faced, all right? First of all, we all know that ASEAN is a regional organization, we are a community. So there's a lot more enhanced co coordination. Uh, to the credit of the medical profession and the public health uh, profession within ASEAN, this cooperation in the medical and public health fields have actually been ongoing for quite some time. I mentioned earlier the SARS, avian flu, and other diseases, they have acted quite well. And not only in terms of having real-time uh, sharing of data and best practices, um, they have hotlines and they're connected to each other. We have the ASEAN Health Ministers Meeting and all the various uh, bodies that have been set up in order to, to support the work of uh, cooperation in these, these medical and public health fields. And it's not only ASEAN, it's between ASEAN and its various dialogue partners. Uh, most closely is between what we call the ASEAN plus three, which includes China, Japan, and the Republic of Korea. So the connections of cooperation has been going on for quite some time. But of course, this, this pandemic, we have to realize, it has, it, it, it creates, it is a different picture in, in the various countries. There's a diversity of conditions. And the picture of pandemic, even within the 10 ASEAN countries, are quite different from one another. Now, I won't go into specifics, but let me just say that, you know, because of the geography, because of the population density, because of different policies, the picture is different. And one might say, oh, this makes it very difficult for ASEAN to cooperate, but not necessarily, all right? Not necessarily. ASEAN is flexible. We are pragmatic. We realize, what is the key principle here? We, we recognize the key principle, and that is that there is, this is a type of challenge that no country can do it alone. So it is absolutely necessary that we enhance the cooperation at the regional level. And as I said, ASEAN has provided the networks and the foundations and the mechanisms and the principles and the SOP, standard operating procedures to enhance such cooperation to, to deal with this pandemic challenge. We can't do it alone. And therefore it has to be done. The national measures, which are very important and which will be different from one country to the other because of the different situation that we face, these national measures will have to be reinforced by regional cooperation and by regional measures. Now, what are some of the uh, principles of such cooperation? Well, it has to be, of course, done on a voluntary and consensus basis, but here we have something that is very strong, and that is a sense of regional identity and mutual benefit. No country can face it alone, so no country can solve it alone, this problem. And therefore, it is to mutual benefit to enhance this regional cooperation. It is guided by the sense of the need for sustainability. We have to have sustainable solutions. Remember, this was a key theme of ASEAN during Thailand's ASEAN chairmanship last year in 2019. Advancing partnership for sustainability. What better way to ensure the overcoming of the pandemic challenge than to have sustainable solutions? We cannot just have a quick fix. And for all of us who follow the pandemic uh, challenge, there is no quick fix. We have to do things in the long run and it has to involve planning for the long term. It is a marathon, not a hundred meter sprint as many doctors and policymakers would say in terms of dealing with this pandemic. So we're gonna have need for sustainable solutions that involves uh, looking, re-looking at how we deal with public health issues, how we deal with the other aspects of the pandemic, which I will not touch today because it's not part of the topic, but this is also equally important. So let me just say very briefly, how do we with the economic consequences of the pandemic? How do we link up supply chains to make them sustainable? Because livelihoods of people are just as equally important as the health. We need the public health issue 
the economic livelihood and the social stability to go hand in hand. All right, but I'm gonna focus more on the public health issue for this particular speech. So these are the, these are the principles that we have to follow. Now, what are the concrete policies that have been developed within ASEAN? Most important, and this is, uh, this is uh, needs um, to be underscored. We need policy leadership. And this has to be done at the highest levels within the ASEAN countries. Each of the ASEAN countries are doing their own national policies, but the impetus for that regional cooperation needs to become at the highest levels. And fortunately we've had uh, the special ASEAN summit around, I think, believe in April, and then, of course, the formal ASEAN summit um, uh, just recently, I believe in June, that has set the policy direction for an enhanced cooperation within ASEAN on dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic challenge in all aspects. I'm going to focus on this, in this particular conversation on the public health issue. But let me just say that the cooperation is quite comprehensive. We've had leadership statements and principles coming up from the ASEAN leaders. But what are some of the specific policies? Uh, one of them uh, is, for example, uh, we have had um, intense um, high level uh, policy coordination and timely data sharing. And this is of course, um, in consistent with WHO protocols. Uh, what are some of the examples here? We have what's called the ASEAN Emergency Operations Center for Public Health Emergencies, the ASEAN EOC. These are being you know, uh, reinforced to share information and data on dealing with this pandemic. We have the ASEAN Biodiaspora Virtual Center to help in risk assessments uh, on a region-wide basis on the COVID-19 challenge. And as I mentioned earlier, we have the very close cooperation with the plus three countries, that is China, Japan, and Republic of Korea. And this is under the ASEAN plus three field epidemiology network. So you, you notice networking, institutions, data sharing, um, real time sharing of information and best practice. This is very important to tracking what are some of the latest advances uh, in the, the efforts to fight against this COVID-19 challenge. Now that is at the medical public health level. At the policy level, we have what is the ASEAN Coordinating Council, uh, which looks at dealing with the COVID-19 challenge in all dimensions. And this is being supported by what's called the ACC, ASEAN Coordinating Council Working Group. Well, what are some of the, the initiatives that have been launched here? Well, the, one of the Thai, key Thai initiatives, which has been fully endorsed by ASEAN and its dialogue partners, is the establishment of the COVID-19 ASEAN Response Fund. Now, this is designed to invite collaboration and contributions from the dialogue partners of ASEAN and within ASEAN in order to fund the production and purchases of uh, PPEs uh, and uh, protective equipment and other essential medical supplies. Uh, the, so these are the things. Uh, this is a concrete initiative that was endorsed by the ASEAN leaders and it is a Thai initiative. And this is being advanced right now in order to, to get contributions uh, from the dialogue partners in order that we, have, we are better protected in terms of equipment and medical supplies to deal with this pandemic in the long run. We are pursuing a policy of promoting, of course, the production of the vaccine as a global public good. Some of the information I've received in recent days is that um, you will require many, many vaccines. There will be no single company that can make all the production by themselves. So, it is essentially to everyone's advantage to share production and to share the, the, um, the vaccine as a global public good. Uh, this is being promoted and, and this is being uh, advanced um, uh, in, in various levels. And as I mentioned at policy level, we need uh, secure supply chains, including for PPEs and medical supplies. So these are being uh, developed within ASEAN and its dialogue partners. We are supporting promoting a regional reserve of medical supplies for public health emergencies and standard operating procedures in order to ensure that uh, people are protected, especially the medical profession from all this. Uh, we are looking to develop the Austin Center on Public Health Emergencies and Emerging Diseases. And of course, we're trying to develop what's called a comprehensive recovery framework. This is to address the other issues related uh, to the pandemic, uh, which is 
not necessarily just public health, but deals with economic livelihoods and social stability. We are mobilizing the various ASEAN centers uh, that have been mentioned. We developed seven ASEAN centers last year. Uh, one of them, the ASEAN Center for Military Medicine is being activated in terms of uh, doing a lot of uh, research and a lot of tabletop exercises to, to help deal, help better prepare national agencies to deal with this pandemic. So the region as a whole is being fully mobilized. And this is under what we call the ASEAN Socio-Cultural Community Pillar, which is one of the three pillars of the ASEAN community. Now you may say, but how come then ASEAN is not more visible? Uh, we don't, how come we don't see much about what ASEAN is doing? Well, public relations is something that ASEAN will, will continue to do. But let us all remember that the primary task of dealing this pandemic is a national effort. And this is the right approach. Why? Because the pandemic picture is very different from Thailand to Singapore, to Lao PDR, to the Philippines, and to other countries around the world. So the national efforts come first. And of course, each country will have its own uh, choices in terms of bilateral cooperation, who they want to cooperate with. But the importance of ASEAN is to provide a policy impetus at the regional level to ensure better coordination, to better ensure better sharing of data, because that is very important. It is, is, as I said, this problem without passport, this pandemic is something which no country, no matter how big or how small, can address alone. And therefore the regional level is very important. ASEAN centers that are being uh, existing in the region are being mobilized to deal with this issue. But we also recognize that ASEAN uh, compared to many other, other regional organizations, is not a, a, a political union. We are an organization of sovereign, uh, 10 sovereign countries or member states. So the regional level will reinforce and will support, but will not you know, overtake uh, the national efforts that are being pursued, each of which amongst the ASEAN countries will be different from one another because of the different conditions that we all face. So this is what is happening at the regional level I'd like to share with you. And before I, 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 I close my remarks, I, as I promised, I wanted to say a little bit about the public health and medical cooperation in the other areas uh, in which uh, beyond the COVID-19, because this is also very important. For example, one of the priorities is to strengthen health systems and access to care and of course, the, the universal health coverage or universal health care is something that we are promoting. And this is what we're trying to do within the ASEAN context and is being quite, uh, uh, you know, received quite positively within ASEAN and, and with various partners around the world, including WHO. We, in fact, we have been cited by, by various organizations as being one of the leaders. Uh, and I'm talking about the global context in terms of uh, universal health and care and coverage. All right, we have active aging. This is also very important. How do we ensure that the aging population of which it is growing here in Southeast Asia are taken care of and are better integrated into society? And this has become even more important because they are now, uh, they have been identified as the more vulnerable of the peoples of society to the pandemics. And there may be future pandemics in the future. So how do we ensure better health care for the aging population better integration of the elderly into our socioeconomic fabric so that we'll have a balance because we all know public health is, is very expensive to, to have so that we can have a better balanced uh, healthcare system cost-wise and other aspects, all right? And that is why the ASEAN Center for Active Aging Innovation was established in Thailand uh, last year during our chairmanship and we are pursuing work on that. Uh, we also working very closely in terms of disaster health management this is also another issue that Thailand attaches importance within ASEAN. Indeed, we, are, we adopted a declaration on disaster health management cooperation within ASEAN last year, a major policy initiative and sense of direction uh, under our chairmanship in 2019. And we are now working to get a plan of action going. Another issue related is food security and addressing the issue of malnutrition and stunting is a major challenge for our region. Surprised, I was surprised to know, for example, that every ASEAN country, um, including the more advanced economies within ASEAN, also have problems of malnutrition and stunting. 
So this is something that we initiated last year in uh, Thailand under its chairmanship, and we are pursuing it uh, continuously. And something that is very relevant to the pandemic challenge we're facing right now is how do we promote ASEAN vaccine security and self-reliance? So this is along the themes of uh, vaccine as a global public good, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, this is something that we are promoting and we are trying to develop what was called a regional strategic and action plan 2021 to 2025. So dear friends, uh, dear colleagues, I've given you a, a, a broad sweep of the context of ASEAN cooperation in dealing with one of the once in a generation challenges or crisis that we're facing right now, which is the COVID-19 pandemic challenge, how we are trying to, we, how we recognize that this is something that no country can face alone. And this is something that would require cooperation at all levels within ASEAN and with the international community. It is a challenge or it is a problem without passports, which requires cross-border global regional collaboration. On the basis and principles of sustainability, we have to find sustainable solutions. On the basis of mutual interest, because that's the only way in order to have cooperation, genuine uh, ongoing cooperation amongst countries. And on the basis of advancing one of the important security issues of our times and our generation, which is the human security component. People-centered community requires sustainable solutions to deal with the human security challenges we're facing right now which is being led by the, um, the problem of the COVID-19 pandemic challenge. And therefore, medical and public health cooperation and collaboration within the ASEAN community will remain an important pillar of the ASEAN socio-cultural community as well as of the ASEAN community as a whole. Why? Because we have no choice. It is a once in a lifetime generation. We hope that from this lesson, ASEAN will be better prepared to deal with this and other pandemics in the future, as well as to further build on the foundation of a people-centered ASEAN community that promotes human security and the health and safety of its peoples as one of its core values and policies. So these are some of the things I'd like to share with you. I've taken about half an hour as promised, and, and I will be happy to take any questions from dear colleagues, and I, I leave it to uh, our, our very capable moderator to manage the questions that will come and I'll do the best I can to answer them uh, as, as best as I can. Thank you very much. Thank you to the speaker for an invaluable and creative lecture to the cooperation and policies. The issues of pandemic among others can be overcome more effectively within ASEAN and the globe. Now is the time for Q&A, question and answer. Our audience who would like to ask questions, please introduce yourself. And for clear connection, please also kindly repeat your question one more time, if you can. Now let's begin with the first question. Dr. Thirapan from PSU at Hajjai. I have uh, listened to your speech for half an hour. And, and we know that ASEAN was established over 50 years and over uh, 10 country of more than 600 million people in, in this region. And then what I was surprised that uh, for several things that we have done the collaboration and be successful like Asian cultural exchange or friendships or, or those, but again, in terms of technology transfer, or in this case, you focus on medical and public health and collaboration in among ASEAN. Uh, we know that in Singapore, medical technology are very advanced and several universities are well established. But again, in terms of uh, technology transfer or helping uh, from one advanced country, because we, we see the difference of those 10 countries. Several countries are very advanced like uh, Singapore or Malaysia. But again, several countries are still uh, in poverty, like in Cambodia, in Philippines, in Indonesia, in Myanmar, in Laos. We can see all those five countries. And 
uh, when we focus on the pandemic of COVID-19, we can see that still we cannot tackle the problem. And also uh, in terms of the human resources development in, in different countries, especially for the one who are below the poverty line and still have the problem, for example, like the air pollution from, from uh, respiratory diseases, from uh, uh, Indonesia to Singapore to Malaysia or even to the southern of Thailand and especially in this case of pandemic of COVID-19, we still haven't seen, even you mentioned that ASEAN have some type of co uh, cooperation, uh, uh, your office estimates a guideline or ASEAN submit, but uh, or as a policy maker, what do you think or how can we we, we help in terms of uh, uniformly distribute of the advanced technology or help uh, the rich help the poor one and how can, how can we, we tackle that problem? Well, I thank you very much for the question. And I think it is a fundamental question that involves not only the public health um, aspect, but it actually can touch on many other issues in the other dimensions. Um, you're, the, the basic question is how do we deal with gaps? And we're talking about gaps in uh, uh, technology, uh, gaps in capabilities, uh, gaps in awareness and knowledge. And it is not only amongst countries in Southeast Asia, but also within countries. And this is a fundamental problem and is a challenge that each and every ASEAN country will have to face. Uh, but what we can do uh, and, and of course the decision on how we address these technological gaps, uh, capability gaps and knowledge gaps uh, within each country will be a national policy. This will be a decision of the various member states. But what ASEAN can do as a whole is try to facilitate uh, the exchanges of some of these and try to have efforts to address some of these gaps. But we all know that uh, technology transfer is a very tricky issue. Um, there are a lot of uh, I have private hospitals and you know, private medical institutions that will of course not want to share everything. Uh, this is after all, a, a, a deals with uh, private property. It's an intellectual property as well. But what us can do is try to encourage the exchanges of such policies and technologies whenever possible. Uh, we all know it's not always easy, but I think we are driven by a similar idea. And what is that idea? The idea is that as because, and this is something that I think the COVID-19 challenge is making much more greater awareness of this particular issue. And what is this issue? And that is, since the pandemic doesn't recognize boundaries, it doesn't recognize who's rich and who's poor, it doesn't recognize anything. It can hit anyone at any time if we're not careful. And what does that mean? That means that the gaps that we have, uh, it is in our all our interests in order to close those gaps. We are only as strong as, as a region, as the weakest link. Because, because we're so connected, if there's any one country that is affected by a pandemic, it will eventually reach all of us because we are connected. The other solution, of course, is to close all our borders permanently. And we all know that's not sustainable. It is not possible for countries around the world to close their borders indefinitely. We will have to open at some point, but at the right time, based on a good balance of uh, medical advice, of, of policies and of the interests that, and that we will have. Okay, so I agree. There are many, many technological capabilities and awareness gaps uh, on the medical front uh, uh, within uh, the ASEAN countries. These are being addressed through the various mechanisms that I've just mentioned. Um, but uh, to, to have a complete uh, immediate transfer of technology, this will be a, a challenge. Uh, this will require, require policy level decisions, but it, it also a lot of these policy decisions will not affect um, the private institutions. If private institutions don't want to share technology, it'll be difficult to force them, but we can try to find a way. And I think this is why I said at the very beginning, the policy level impetus of cooperation that has been exercised by the 10 ASEAN leaders has been very important in order to get uh, you know, forward movement all these issues. So that is an important issue. I'm glad it's being raised and we will to continue to find a way to deal with these various gaps. Thank you very much. Can I have the next question, please? Your Excellency, this is uh, Wimbrosip, uh, Vice President. 
uh, for human resources and, and quality assurance. Um, uh, thank you very much for your insight, uh, for the talk that you gave to us. My, my question to you is the, about the, the pandemic, the COVID-19, as, as we witness now that uh, there are still many countries in ASEAN that uh, still face big problems like mm -hmm. Myanmar or, or Indonesia or the Philippines. And I think that's, that, that affects us also. I, I'm not sure that uh, in, in ASEAN, how, what, what are the levels of uh, uh, cooperation that you mentioned? Uh, how or, or is there any help within the ASEAN communities to help tackle the problem? Let's say in Myanmar, uh, that the border, we share border with Thailand or, or, or we, we share border with Myanmar or, or Indonesia and Malaysia in, in Borneo. Um, what, what are the, the collaborations and, and furthermore about the vaccines that we, we see that uh, uh, in the next few months, I think we will get some, hopefully we'll get some vaccines. Uh, seems like from the AstraZeneca, the Oxford University study we will come out. Uh, will, will there be collaboration or will, will there be competitive among us, you know, to get to the vaccines and things uh, or what are the level of collaborations among the ASEAN countries? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think the ASEAN collaboration is uh, ongoing in many different levels. I have not gone to detail on every single one. Let me just underscore a couple of points which, are, which I've made earlier. The first thing is, of course, it is critically important to have that timely data uh, information and best practices sharing. And this is already uh, in full gear. It's in, uh, going at full speed and it's been going not even before the pandemic. And this has been utilized uh, not only within ASEAN, but within, as I mentioned, the ASEAN plus three uh, since the SARS. So SARS was really the one of the first pandemics that really brought ASEAN and the ASEAN plus three to, to collaborate much more advanced uh, in these areas. Okay, but now going more specifically um, to, to the question as to what can ASEAN do more? I very mentioned the COVID-19 ASEAN res uh, response fund and all the various other initiatives. Um, I think the, the one of the key questions that I detect in the question is what do we do with vaccines, all right? It is seen as something that will help uh, deal with the pandemic in the short and long term. Um, what can we do? The, the principle I think that ASEAN has agreed to is that it should be a global public good, all right? This is a strong Thai position. Uh, it is a strong Thai position. It's a, it's a strong position for many other countries uh, and all the countries within ASEAN, all right? Um, this is how do, we, how do we help promote vaccine as a global public good, all right? And the reality, the reality is that vaccines are developed by private companies and some governments. And there are obviously some, some uh, prop, uh, IPR issues related. But the broader picture is that the need for vaccines will be so high that there will be no single company or country that can do it alone. At the end of the day, there will have to be collaboration in terms of production. Where will it be produced, for example? I'll give you an example as, as the time ambassador here in Singapore. One of the policies that they have here in Singapore is what we call vaccine multilateralism. And one of the ideas of that is that um, uh, the country is offering its, its um, medical and production capacities and inviting uh, foreign companies, uh, medical pharmaceutical companies, to consider working with these uh, manufacturing uh, capacities, using these manufacturing capacities here in Singapore in order to produce the vaccine and to package it and to ship it, all right? Now, if you look at the numbers involved, uh, there'll be billions and billions of doses required. So it is not possible for any country or any company to do it alone. At the end of the day, the production capacity has to be shared and that the vaccine capacity also, uh, uh, the vaccine itself, final product will have to be shared. Now the actual formula as to how it would come out is, is being developed uh, in, in various uh, modalities, including with the WHO. Uh, this is something that Thailand Asin is involved in as well. And so there is a policy, you know, to promote uh, vaccine as a global public good, especially for COVID-19. It is a policy that is being strongly pursued uh, by the ASEAN countries. Um, so this is something that we can see happening. And there is nothing that will prevent bilateral cooperation amongst ASEAN countries from happening, whether it's between, you know, Thailand and a neighboring country of Thailand or other countries within Southeast Asia. 
So these are things that will have to be pursued, uh, the details of which are being worked out. Uh, but uh, it comes back to my own point, my, the point that I'd like to underscore once again. This is a problem without passports, which no country and no company uh, can face alone. And therefore, it would require cooperation at some point, sooner or later, uh, in order to have uh, the right, whether it's therapeutics or whether it's the vaccine, for the several billions of people around the world who will be in need, need of them uh, in the future. Thank you. Next question, please. Assistant Professor Dr. Supatra Davison, the director of the Dr. Thanat Foreman ASEAN Study Center at Prince of Songkhla University. I have a question, Your Excellency. As uh, Your Excellency pointed out, that there are, there are many, many official mechanisms exist at the country or institute levels, including sharing facts and information. To be more practical and specific, since Thailand is doing so well in dealing with COVID-19, how can we help other ASEAN countries deal with their pandemic problems? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the very practical question. Um, well, the, aside from the information sharing that you mentioned, I think one of the initiatives that the Thailand has been pursuing since the special summit uh, earlier this year of ASEAN uh, and, and formalized and the formal summit um, uh, that was, it's a virtual summit that was convened um, a couple months ago, uh, is the idea of the ASEAN uh, COVID-19 response fund that will help um, countries in need within ASEAN to acquire uh, PPEs and other essential medical supplies uh, more effectively, all right? And this is something that we're trying to collaborate uh, uh, not only within ASEAN, but with dialogue partners in order to get funding and contributions from them um, so that we can be better prepared um, uh, to, to deal with the problem as we face right now. Uh, vaccine development, as I mentioned, is, is something that ASEAN will probably have to look into and it is pursuing. Uh, we already attach high priority. I mentioned earlier of the, um, of the, the priority that we have for, for developing a vaccine strategy in the long run uh, within ASEAN. And, and so, and so um, we think that because of the great need that will be required to provide the billions of doses, uh, um, you know, for the next year or so. Uh, it will it will result in my projection, in terms of uh, mobilizing the production capacities of the countries in the region, and I would assume I would assume that Thailand would be part of that because we do have good production capacities uh, to to be engaged in the vaccine uh, development, production, manufacturing, and shipping. Uh, and this is something um, that uh, ultimately, uh, in my uh, projection, would, would have to be uh, collaborated with uh, the neighboring countries as well. Um, so this is something that I see in terms of how we can help. Uh, we have our expertise and it is to our interests. It is in our interest. If we have a, a neighboring countries with lower infection rates, if we have uh, neighboring countries that can control the pandemic, it is in our interest. We have uh, movements of labor, uh, movements of peoples. Uh, we, our economy, uh, a lot of our, some of our economy is reliant on, on workers uh, from neighboring countries. And if we can have an arrangement that will ensure you know, safe, healthy workers, uh, from neighboring countries, then it is in everyone's interest. Let me give you an example of what's happening uh, here in, in Singapore as I am the ambassador of Thailand here in Singapore. Do you know that every day around 250,000 to 300,000 people move across the border between Singapore and Malaysia every day, all right? Every day. This has stopped of course because of the pandemic, but in preparation, for the movement of people across borders because the economies of both countries rely on people working, living in one country, but working in another. This has been the way between Singapore and Malaysia for quite some time. And therefore there are plans to develop, um, as I understand it, rapid testing that will allow for testing capacities of perhaps 250,000 to 300,000 people per day 
in order to facilitate the movements of people across borders, at least in this case between uh, Singapore and Malaysia. This is the this is being discussed. All right, uh, there are already arrangements uh, for uh, what we call green lanes between uh, Singapore and Malaysia for business people to travel uh, with less restrictions. And there are other arrangements as well between Singapore and Malaysia. This is the this is the big target. How do you, how how can we manage the movements of 250,000, 300,000 people every day between Singapore and Malaysia in under the new normal? All right. So uh, this is a, an example of how countries can work together. This is something that um, uh, it is uh, if if we are to make full use of the human resources of our neighboring countries uh, for mutual benefit, then uh, perhaps uh, you know, we will have to look into such arrangements uh, in the future. And this will have to be done bilaterally. The ASEAN may provide an overall framework, but for practical reasons, it has to be done between say uh, Thailand and a neighboring country or between two ASEAN countries. And one of the examples right now, I'd just like to share with you is between Singapore and Malaysia. Thank you very much. Um, I leave it to the moderator. I don't know how much time I have left, but I'm at your disposal. More questions? No. Uh, uh, Your Excellency, may I ask a little bit about medical tourism? Yes. Uh, that uh, uh, is, is one of the major, major issues in our policy to do that. But, but in Singapore, also very strong in, in this uh, uh, business in, in medical tourism. Uh, uh, how, how do you see this in a way, I think it's a, a bit of competition among us, even Malaysia and Vietnam will do that in the future also. Uh, uh, what should we do? What, what, are, what are the preparations or, or what if, if uh, in Thailand to, to be able to, to keep our lead, if, if we are leaders uh, 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 in, in this arena? Uh, uh, I'd like to have your, your, your thought on that, please. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, let me talk, divide my answer into two parts. The first part is under normal situation, and then the second part under the new normal, all right? Now, medical tourism under the normal situation, if there's no COVID or we found a, a vaccine and it's, or it's been uh, overcome as a pandemic, um, basically medical tourism is something that, uh, well, the two countries in Southeast Asia, they have, they're very strong on this, including uh, three, including Malaysia. So it's Thailand, Singapore, and Malaysia. We have different clientele, we have different target groups. I'm sure the need for medical facilities will still be high um, you know, in the three countries. So there, I, I do not see there has to be uh, intense competition uh, amongst uh, the three countries. We have our medical facilities that are world renowned, especially in Thailand. Thailand, we have our strengths. Uh, we have the combination of the very good and professional world recognized medical services at competitive prices plus medical well-being, wellness, tourism, and other things, uh, you know, um, which, which makes the Thai package uh, quite attractive and world-renowned, all right? But there's no need for competition amongst countries. I think that we have different uh, um, uh, facilities and, and strengths uh, between various countries in Southeast Asia to offer. This is under the, um, the, uh, the normal situation. Now, of course, with the new normal, the question is how do we package medical tourism under the situation of a, either a COVID situation or a post COVID situation? How do we deal with the various safeguards? Now each country will do it differently. I think that's, the, um, that's the, uh, what's happening uh, uh, in, in our region. Um, I know uh, for, for Thailand, we still have uh, the very important and very strict uh, 14 day of quarantine, all right? Some countries, uh, like in Singapore, they, they have now uh, not required, no longer require uh, such quarantine periods for selected countries, for selected countries. And I understand if I, my information is correct, uh, for example, the two ASEAN countries that no longer require quarantine when they arrive in Singapore uh, are Brunei, Jerusalem, and Vietnam. For example, well, as Thai ambassador here in Singapore, I'm working uh, with all parties um, uh, to ensure that we have the appropriate safeguards between Thailand and Singapore. So, so this is something that uh, we will continue to work out. 
But the important thing is that um, the need for medical services will continue to grow. And whether you call it medical tourism or some other term, uh, that need will still be uh, there once we have the appropriate safeguards in place and once uh, air travel moves slowly back to normal. We don't know when that's gonna happen. But in the meantime, until we reach that stage, um, uh, it will be a policy decision as to how do we combine medical tourism or medical visits. I think, I, think I, 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 I would like to avoid the use of medical tourism for the time being, but how do we combine medical visits that will allow uh, foreign nationals to come to Thailand for the medical care and perhaps combine that with other wellness and, and possible tourism programs, uh, but under a, a safeguard measures that is balanced, that takes into account both the uh, medical prerequisites, uh, the safety and security of the people within Thailand, and of course with the need to uh, kickstart and to further strengthen economic activities of which tourism, uh, or at least uh, the, the, um, the entry of foreign nationals uh, can play an important part. So these are important policy considerations that are, are continually being monitored and refined. Um, but the bottom line is I don't see the need for competition. We each, each of the countries in Southeast Asia in Indian ASEAN have different packages. And we certainly in Thailand have our strengths uh, that uh, we are confident in. Thank you. May I? Um, I'm Dr. Santon Mosri, uh, the white person for research and innovations. So I have a, a little questions about, this might be in the future. This is the ones in the first ones about the first beginning that hit to our, this world. But in the future, it might be another hit, another virus, another serious problems, another violence that is might be happens. But I still believe that ASEAN systems may be the one of the major tools that can prevent the spread out. What is kind of the thing that we should do after the post-COVID that we can prevent it in the futures of the another series of the virus system may be quite serious. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I think planning for the future or scenario planning has been one of the themes of the sustainability um, theme of the ASEAN Chairmanship of Thailand since last year. So we have to really start thinking about the future. And I think one of the things that uh, we will have to probably reinforce is the much more timely sharing of information and practices, SOPs, or oh, these standard operating procedures that should be in place if a pandemic strikes, what are the things that have to be done? These actually, to be fair, has already been well in place since the SARS challenge. It has to be refined continuously. I think what we are looking now is how do we ensure that we have the necessary mess, essential medical supplies and the PPEs uh, that would be in place. I remember this was a big issue, the masks, the shortages of masks was a major issue. It was one major issue here in Singapore because uh, the, for example, I can share with you, many of the, the companies um, that um, own the production of these facilities, but the facilities are located outside of Singapore. They're located in some other, some other economies and countries. And so it was different. And once the ban on the export and imports of these PPEs happened, there was no access. So we will have to look into how do we ensure more efficient and connected supply chains that are sustainable and secure within the region. So shorter supply chains. This is something that will benefit the ASEAN community. Uh, this is something that we can do. And of course, um, we will need constant policy coordination. ASEAN centers in the region have to be mobilized and look into how they can help contribute to the pandemic. The ASEAN Center for Military Medicine did not have a pandemic in mind when it was created, but it had to be adjusted and, and do the necessary things in order to help contribute to the um, uh, dealing with the pandemic. So, so these are the things I think that ASEAN uh, has to get ready, uh, get in place. Um, we will have to look at issues like regional stockpiles of uh, PPE medical supplies. Can this be done? It is certainly one of the ideas that I've mentioned that is being developed. So we have to think more of the future. We have to think in more sustainable terms. And we have to make sure that human security, people-centered interests of which 
the livelihood and medical safety of people are important part continues to be in the mainstream of ASEAN policies. Thank you. All right, there seems to be a lot more work and collaboration to do for ASEAN with positive expectations. And that concludes Dr. Tanat Common's speech of the seventh ASEAN week organized by Dr. Tanat Common, ASEAN Studies Center, Prince of Songkhla University. May I call upon PSU President for closing speech? Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, Ambassador Dr. Surya Jindawong, for a very inspiring and informative speech and discussion. For Thai citizens, it is very reassuring that during COVID-19 pandemic, we are working together with our friends. And this certainly to assure that ASEAN is a caring and sharing community. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the uh, organizer and then also the speaker. Thank you, PSU President. And also thank you, everyone. Until next time, goodbye. Sorry, Kap. Sorry, Kap. Sorry, Kap. Thank you, Captain.